Cause I get to talk about it with Jose. Debuting in the year 2000, Malcolm in the Middle had a profound impact on the world of television sitcoms. The show centered its stories around an over-the-top family while popularizing a single-camera style of filming on network television. Throughout its run, it was nominated for multiple awards, was a critical darling, and achieved rating success before finally coming to an end in its seventh season. The series was created by Linwood Boomer. Originally an actor, he broke into the TV world as the character Adam Kendall on the series Little House of the Prairie. He gradually moved towards writing and producing, soon finding himself working on a number of TV sitcoms. In the writer's room, he would entertain his colleagues with stories of his family growing up, and eventually he put together a pilot based on those early years of his life. Boomer was considered gifted and put into special classes, much like the main character on his show, Malcolm. My mom would never tell me what my IQ was, so when I wrote Malcolm, I said his IQ was 165. My mom then told me that mine was never that high. The idea of a child prodigy in less than ideal circumstances was at the center of Boomer's pitch. It was easy to write because I knew the material. I'd been thinking about it for a very long time, and a lot of those pieces in the pilot were pieces of my life. I'd spent a lot of time telling them as anecdotes. They were polished. Although it was shown to several different networks, the show ultimately landed on Fox, a network with a history for depicting non-traditional family dynamics, at least non-traditional when it came to what you would see on network television. The role of Malcolm was given to Frankie Muniz. Originally written as a nine-year-old, Malcolm's age was instead made vague to accommodate the 13-year-old Muniz. Although Boomer considered himself at that age to be more antagonistic, Malcolm was written to be more of a charming eccentric, a genius living in a family of underachievers, trying to understand a world that demeans people like him. Now, you can look at this picture for 60 seconds, and I want you to tell me everything that's wrong with it, okay? Yes, the car shadow's going the wrong way. The steering wheel's on the wrong side. There's no brake pedal. The words in the mirror should be backwards. The guy's watch wouldn't say 12 o'clock if he's looking at a sunset, and I have red paint on my ass. That's right, red paint all over my ass. Jane Kaczmarek was cast as Malcolm's mother, Lois. It was a role that earned Kaczmarek seven Emmy nominations for a lead actress in a comedy series, one for every year the show was on the air, though sadly she would never win the award. She does hold the record for most nominations within that category without actually winning it. Along with Malcolm, Lois was one of the two characters left largely unchanged from the original script for the pilot, the fierce matriarch of her family that holds them together through sheer force of will. No faces, no tongues, no crossed eyes, no bunny ears. We are gonna smile. We are gonna look good. It is gonna cost us $9.99, and all of this is gonna happen by the time I count to three. There's not a there's not a chair, like two, two, three, 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 three. three. Brian Cranston was cast as the father of the family, Hal, and unlike the other characters, was radically transformed by the actor. Originally a ghostly presence in the series, Cranston played Hal as a character motivated by fear. This opened him up to some of the more absurd plot lines and physical gags, with stunts often performed by Cranston himself. You boys are in so much trouble! You've got to help me on this. I can't believe that you could be so thoughtless! We all screwed up really big this time. I have a good mind to use the belt on all three of you! Why are you yelling at us? Sorry isn't good enough, mister. I forgot your mom's birthday! The oldest child of the family, Francis, was played by Christopher Masterson. Having been sent away to military school, Francis typically appears in his own self-contained plot lines, disconnected from the stories back in his family's household. Though he does appear in a handful of episodes that bring everyone together for some chaos. Alright, that's enough! Party's over! Do you guys have any respect for the dead? You took his wallet! Lester would have wanted me to have his ID. Justin Burfield played the second oldest brother, Reese. Although technically younger than Frankie Muniz, his character was a year older on the show. Reese is the dimmest member of the family. He would only be caught using his head to solve a problem if it meant smashing it against something. Wow! <laughs> oh my god, the look in your face! I was totally worth it! You're the worst brother ever! I know, I know! The final member of the family is Dewey, played by Eric Per Sullivan, the youngest member of the family, at least in the beginning. He began the series as a cute bit of comic relief and gradually grew into a budding musical virtuoso by the series' end. How much does my head weigh? Zero. Zero. In the pilot episode of the series, the family was given the name Wilkerson, though this was dropped afterwards to avoid any specific ethnic label for them. 
in the interest of sticking to how they're most often presented in the series, I'm going to avoid using any last name for the family. The cast was joined by a host of other characters, such as Craig Feldspar, played by David Anthony Higgins, Malcolm's friend Stevie Carnarvon, played by Craig Lamar Trailer, and Lois's mother Ida, played by Cloris Leachman. Another vital aspect of the series was its style, which was unique on network television at the time, breaking the tradition of a multi-camera setup, where a scene was filmed from multiple angles at once, Malcolm in the Middle opted to use a single camera for filming, something more akin to dramas on network television or comedies on cable television. There was no studio audience, or laugh track for that matter, and to compensate, the series used a number of techniques, camera movements, montages, and lots of changes in filming locations. Although commonplace among comedies today, back in 2000, this was incredibly rare for network television sitcoms. Malcolm in the Middle premiered on January 9th, 2000, on Sunday night between The Simpsons and The X-Files. It was a plum spot, and an advertising blitz ensured that this show would have every advantage possible to make a strong first impression. And a strong first impression is exactly what it made. Every day is a lottery, and first prize is that you don't have to scoot yourself around town on a skateboard with your hands. You think about that. The first episode of the series, creatively titled Pilot, begins with Malcolm offering some narration to the camera. You want to know what the best thing about childhood is? At some point it stops. A rarity for TV sitcoms, Malcolm offers us a running narration throughout the series, giving us some insight into how his mind works in any given scene. But this does more than provide context. It lets us see into the mind of a genius to realize that the things he cares about in life aren't all that different from what we care about. After the opening credits, with a song performed by They Might Be Giants, we meet the rest of Malcolm's family. Malcolm and his brothers have two states of being in their home. They're either fighting with each other, or they're asleep. While the boys walk to school, Francis is introduced through a short montage. Dad, I know what you're gonna say, and believe me, I totally agree with you. There is no excuse for what I did. It was idiotic, immature, totally reckless, and I'm really sorry. I'm just, I'm hoping against hope that you will give me another chance, which I admit I don't deserve. If you could just find it in your heart to forgive me, I know I could earn your trust back. It's here we see two strengths of the show's style. On your standard sitcom, there are usually only a handful of locations, due to the cost and effort of building new sets for a multi-camera setup. A single camera lets them film on various locations more easily, so we get to see things that would otherwise be summarized by dialogue. In this example, it's the many exploits of Francis, shown through a series of quick cuts, watching the chaos of his teenage years unfold, rather than having it summarized by a character describing his antics. This moment would have far less impact if it was someone talking about how Francis lit a car on fire and hooked up with a girl. Instead, we actually get to see it. The episode's plot introduces the premise of Malcolm's genius finally being noticed in school and him being brought into the gifted class. Now, Malcolm may not look different than the rest of us, but he is very different in his brain. We meet Malcolm's eventual friend Stevie, and Malcolm reluctantly connects with him. Mom says, TV makes you stupid. No, TV makes you normal. How can they do that? He's in a wheelchair. The idea of being normal comes up a lot in this series. and Malcolm is desperate to hold on to that. I don't want to go to a special class. People think I'm weird enough already. I know. I like where I am. I want to stay. Sweetie, life does not give you a lot of chances to move up, even if you deserve it. Look at your dad and me. By the end of the episode, we realize that this is Malcolm's first step into realizing he doesn't quite fit in with the rest of the world, that he isn't quite normal. Around here, being smart is exactly like being radioactive. Although most of us aren't geniuses, what's relatable here is the feeling of not quite fitting in at school, of being unsure of where exactly your place is in the world. In Malcolm's case, he's a genius. But for other kids, it might mean braces, an unexpected growth spurt, or having to move somewhere new. This episode's resolution sees Malcolm embracing Stevie as a friend, standing up to a bully, and deciding to make the most of his new situation. Although rough around the edges, Malcolm is a good kid, and now he's stuck trying to figure out his new status as a Krellboyn. In the series, Krellboyn is a term used to describe kids in the gifted program. It gradually fades away over time as Malcolm's Krellboyn friends become a less prominent part of the series. The name is a reference to the Rick Moranis character in the 1986 movie Little Shop of Horrors. It's hard to imagine kids in the year 2000 having strong memories of a 14-year-old horror musical, 
This is one of those little details that reminds us this is a show written by adults about kids who don't necessarily have their finger on the pulse of pop culture in the 2000s. This episode includes the first and only appearance of the family's last name, Wilkerson, seen here on Francis's name tag. The pilot was a huge success, winning Primetime Emmy Awards for Writing for a Comedy Series, awarded to Linwood Boomer, and Directing, awarded to Todd Holland. In the ratings, it pulled in 22.4 million viewers, and the following week's episode, Red Dress, set a series high for 23.3 million viewers, although the first season would eventually settle to an average of roughly 15 million viewers per episode. The episode Red Dress also includes one of the most obvious shots of a crew member in an episode I've ever seen. Another thing that made Malcolm in the Middle different was how it structured its episodes. While other sitcoms would have a main plot line and a shorter backup plot line in each episode, Malcolm in the Middle could sometimes include up to four different plot lines running through a single episode. It ensured that, even though Malcolm was the main character, he would never have to shoulder the bulk of each episode, and really emphasized that the show was an ensemble cast. Malcolm's teacher, Caroline Miller, played by Catherine Lloyd Burns, is credited as a principal member of the cast, though that would only last for the season. She serves as a guide for Malcolm into his new surroundings in the Gifted class. Malcolm's world in the Gifted class, self-contained in the first few episodes, comes crashing up against the reality of his family in the episode Crawl Boyne Picnic. Well, they're not my friends. Oh, they're a bunch Alex. of geeks and losers. Malcolm's in the house! Malcolm! 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 Up to this point, Malcolm's intelligence has largely just been an abstract IQ score, but the climax of this episode shows us what his brain is truly capable of. The fact is that 2, 2, 2, and 73. Multiplied by pi. 26 and 261,000. Cubic. 584 and 214,000. What's the arctangent? 89 and 9 tenths degrees. Natural law. 6 and 3,699 10,000. What's the reciprocal? 17 10,000. You make 11,431. What's the capital of Iceland? Reykjavik. But that's not math. And much to Malcolm's relief, he finds out his family, while shocked, isn't about to treat him like a completely different person. Hey, Malcolm. How many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> One interesting distinction here is that Malcolm isn't entirely alone. Throughout this episode, the Krell boys are constantly fawning over him. He's the smartest kid in class, and they're all deeply impressed, and it's heavily implied in the series that these nerds being bullied in the present are destined for great things in the future. Malcolm is literally being welcomed into a new class of people, and he's afraid of losing his place in the world he would have to leave behind, represented by his family. Malcolm's family is not rich. Far from it, in fact. One of the running themes of the series is just how little money they have for anything. Malcolm shares a room with his two brothers, both parents work dead-end jobs, and their house is in a constant state of disrepair. The outside world is a cruel place for the family, and while they may torment one another, they also protect each other as well. Malcolm's fear of losing that connection and being swept up into that new world is another reason his family is so important to him. He's seen enough of the world to know that even if he has an edge, he's just a few mistakes back into that same rut his family ended up in. While the Krellboins are convinced the world will get better for them in the future, Malcolm is well aware that it isn't good for them in the present. The laws of the playground don't favor the smart, they favor the strong. And the Krellboin kids are constantly bullied. While Malcolm's family can make him feel like he's been cursed, it's all he really has to hold on to. There's no winning for Malcolm. He can only lose the least amount possible. And in this case, it's about not losing his family. The dynamic between Hal and Lois is interesting insofar that you have this very strong mother figure taking charge of the family, and a father figure who's a bit more fearful and timid. Not afraid of his wife, of course, but more the world around him. This unique dynamic invites a conversation about gender roles on the show. Men in this series are generally presented as uncivilized brutes, only tamed by the presence of women. In the first season, we can see two examples, with Reese going from schoolyard bully to quivering mess when dealing with a crush. Were you crying? No, I was reading. You don't read. Just shut the door, Krailboin. Eventually, Hal sits him down, along with the other boys, for a talk. Unfortunately, if the boy is from our family, it goes a little more like this. I like you. I hate you! No, I love you! Leave me alone! Your insane neediness is driving me away! Look at me! Look at me! Look! Oh, I'm crazy! Look at I can- oh. There's no explaining it. It's hereditary. 
The idea of this destructive behavior being genetic is a bit worrying, and we actually see it challenged in the episode where Reese, instead of acting like a maniac, takes an interest in his crush's cheerleading and then trying to talk to her. One day I really like you. Like when a boy likes a girl. Normal and healthy. I'm sorry for hurting you all those times. I'm really not a bad guy. Anyways. Thanks. I like you too. The pyramid, a symbol of ancient civilization, is a fitting metaphor for gender roles, as Reese and Wendy decide to connect in a meaningful way, instead of the more primal fashion described by Hal, it risks the very pillars that hold this social order together. Even if society is brought down around them, the bond between two people survives, and isn't that more meaningful than some dumb pyramid? We can see the impact of Lois on Hal in the episode The Bots and the Bees, where Lois's departure causes Hal to regress into the person he was before he met her. Hal is a dangerous rebel, untamed and wild, so long as Lois isn't around. Hal and Reese are interesting to contrast in these two episodes. The show presents rebellious behavior as a method of attracting women and as a product of being outside their influence. It's an outward sign that a man needs a woman to civilize him. In one generation, we see this script followed unthinkingly, and in another, it's contradicted. Reese ends up with a potential new love interest, and Hal ends up covered in bees. It's the difference between critically examining yourself and internalizing what you think society is telling you a man should be, reducing it to some kind of biological imperative. Season 1 ended with the episode Water Park, Part 1. The plot lines here are mostly concluded at the end of the episode, with the exception of Dewey, who had been left all at home with a babysitter who dies by the end of the episode, leaving Dewey completely unattended. And you get very sick, and eventually your optic nerve rots away and your eyes fall out. The season 2 opener, Traffic Jam Part 2, has the family stuck in traffic while trying to return home from the water park. While technically a continuation of the previous episode, the plot lines are all new, with every member of the family in their own storyline. The Dewey plotline, carried over from last season, is resolved when he's finally brought home by some bikers. But the one plotline from this episode I want to highlight is how Lois tries to resolve the traffic jam through sheer force of will. Start. The. Green. You can't tell me what to do. Lois, who is such a dominant force throughout the first season, is starting to show the limits of her power. And this note is hit again this season in the episode traffic ticket. That's uh, 624. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Your total is uh, $6.24. What's this all about? You impeded traffic. When you pulled out, that Volkswagen had to slam on its brakes. What Volkswagen? I looked over my left when I pulled out. There was no car. License and registration, ma'am. I think standing up for myself is worth the trouble. I think refusing to be railroaded is worth the trouble. I know I can win this because I know I'm right. I can't believe you have so little faith in me. I have complete faith in you. It's the rest of the world that I don't have faith in. Things could look different to different people. The system can be corrupt. We wouldn't be in this situation if that weren't true. And sometimes, Lois, being right isn't enough. Being right is everything. The contrast between Lois being the voice of authority and her using that voice to stand up to a greater authority reveals that at the heart of the character, Lois believes in a higher form of morality. There's a theory of moral development created by American psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg that describes how we grow as moral beings, moving from understanding morals as rules we use to achieve certain outcomes to applying a system of universal ethics. Lois operates at the post-conventional level, certain of her morals and bucking at the system when it won't let her express them. And when Lois is disciplining her children, she's trying to move them up that ladder. In later seasons, we'd see examples of Lois bending to the rules, but this is typically a product of her needing something from the system, like keeping her job. Although Lois is trying to instill a higher order of morality in her kids, she's also capable of realizing that a system requires some degree of conformity for survival. Going back to Hal's response to Lois about the world working against the family, this is brought into sharp focus throughout the series, and this season has some great examples. In the episode, New Neighbors, we find out the family has had a less than positive relationship with most of the other families on their street. Families keep moving in and out of that house. I wonder why. <laughs> the neighbors here represent the world at large. One important part of this episode is how it shows just what brings the family together. An outside threat, like New Neighbors. I think the word everyone is tiptoeing around is feud. That's a bit drastic, Reese. No, Dad. A feud is just what this family needs. 
Having a common enemy will hone our skills and unite us in a brotherhood of blood. Some of the better episodes intersect their various plot lines using this very principle. The ending to Lois's birthday uses a similar conclusion, where the family bands together to fight off a group of clowns. The show never explains why so many clowns are hanging out at the batting cages, unless that one birthday party had four clowns, which seems excessive to me. The economics of hiring clowns aside, the family's ability to hold together against outside threats is a frequent theme throughout the series. It echoes other sitcoms featuring working-class families, where an external conflict symbolizing the hostility of the outside world, requires the family to band together as a single unit. Season 2 also introduced a few memorable supporting cast members, including Cynthia, played by Tania Raymond, a girl in Malcolm's gifted class he has a crush on. Although not the first or last girl Malcolm would explore his feelings for, Cynthia is probably the most memorable. <laughs> Now, if I apply pressure like this for 10 seconds, you'll pass out. If I do it for 20 seconds, you'll die of a brain hemorrhage. Cool. Sadly, Cynthia would only hang around until season 4, and was replaced before then by a rotation of increasingly forgettable love interests. And season 2 introduced us to another special talent held by one of the boys, Reese, who is a gifted chef. Dad, I just wanted to let you know how much that cooking class means to me. If you hadn't signed me up for it, I never would have known that something so stupid could be so much fun. Thanks. Oh, come on, that's gotta make you feel good. But season two's most celebrated episode, by far, is bowling. The episode uses the premise of either Hal or Lois taking the boys out bowling and displaying two stories in parallel that represent the different timelines created depending on which parent takes the boys out on that trip. While the respective stories offer a few interesting twists and turns, it's the novelty of how they're presented that really sets this episode apart, using creative editing techniques to highlight each timeline transition. The fortunes of the characters vary, and the episode contrasts Hal's loose parenting style with Lois's stricter style to create happy endings for different boys. A good night out is a roll of the dice, and neither parent is necessarily better than the other, but each one has their own strengths and weaknesses. Highly praised at the time, it won two Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Directing and Writing for a Comedy Series for Todd Holland and Alex Reed, respectively. To be perfectly honest, it's a struggle for me to find much to say about this episode outside of its style. The randomness of parenting and the largely forgettable nature of both storylines makes me think a lot of the acclaim this episode got was for its technical achievement. Episodes like this make me feel as though Malcolm in the Middle's more interesting aspects were overshadowed by its style. The better episodes did have some interesting commentary in them, but the show was so unique in its presentation at the time that it garnered most of the critical attention. The last episode I want to highlight from this season is Flashback, where we see how parenthood ruined the family's fortunes through a series of flashbacks. I have been the leader in sales for this company for five years running. No one has ever done that before. And all I'm asking is to cut back on my hours just a little tiny bit so I can help out at home. I mean, you have kids, you know how it is. Absolutely, Al. Don't worry, we'll find a way to make this work. Hey, Al. Come here, Phil. The episode ends with Hal and Lois reminding each other of why they're in love. I love that nothing in my life is complete until I've shared it with you. Negative. Oh, that worry for nothing. Girl would have been nice, though. Are you kidding? We've got you out number five to one now, and we're still losing. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a sweet episode. Love holds the family together in the face of their increasingly dire circumstances. The episode is an inversion of the threats highlighted in the episodes like New Neighbors. This shows how families create disruptions in their own lives, but unlike the hostile world, a family can offer the very real reward of comfort and love. Even when the world is literally raining on you and the only dry space is a house with three screaming boys, it's not so bad when you know there's some love in there too. Part of why I think this show struck a chord with so many people is because of that. Most people's families are messy and complicated, but there's still a core of love in there. This was a sitcom that dared to show an unvarnished version of that love. Check out the pat melons! They still do the trick! Unlike the other boys in his family, Francis's plot lines are typically far removed from the other characters in the household. Starting the series off in a military academy, his plot lines contain their own unique supporting cast, where Francis and his buddies are constantly at odds with the demanding Commandant Spangler, played by Daniel Van Borgen. Season 3 completely changes Francis's circumstances as he emancipates himself, letting him leave the military academy 
and heads to Alaska for promises of riches with his friend Eric Hansen, played by Eric Nenninger. Francis' stories in the first two seasons center around rebellion against authority, and the third is no exception. When he travels to Alaska in season three, he finds himself working a rough job under the auspice of the hot-tempered Lavernia, played by Brenda Well. This is precisely what military school prepared us for, to wage war against all authority no matter what the odds. Now, she may be a cruel, manipulative monster, but Mom can't win every round. Who? Lavernia! Season 3 also meant the introduction of the most prominent member of Francis' supporting cast, Piyama, played by Emmy Colegado. Piyama introduces a shift in Francis towards more responsible behavior, eventually leading him to work as a ranch hand in Season 4, though he never quite gets it together in a way suggested by her early appearances. And while I think it's neat that the show included an indigenous character of an unspecified tribe, and Colgado does do a great job in her performance, it's a little awkward seeing an indigenous character portrayed by someone whose background is Filipino, which is literally on the other side of the world. Francis as a character is a symbol of unfocused rebellion. While it might be tempting to write him off as a bad seed, Francis demonstrates kindness and intelligence throughout the series, though it never manifests itself in the special ways we see in his brothers. Reese has his cooking, Malcolm is a genius, and Dewey eventually blossoms into a musician. But Francis never gets any special skills. As we only see him in his feudal struggles against a military school trying to shape him and a low-paying job exploiting him, this is a commentary on how the world punishes rebellion. With his brothers as a comparison, it appears though the family space is the one that affords the chance to explore possibilities and push limits in a safe way. And one thing all the boys in this family do is consistently push the limits through their acts of rebellion against authority. After his family sent him to military school, Francis was more or less at the mercy of the system, and this show demonstrates that the system does not care about him at all. He can either become a military drone or work a dead-end job in misery. The closest we see to Francis living a happy life is in season 4, with a boss who treats him with kindness and respect, though in this case it's an outsider to that system, Otto Mancuser, played by Kenneth Mars. Eventually, Francis drops the ball there too. Perhaps it was just too late for him to learn how to function in society. Or perhaps more accurately, Christopher Masterson would have less of an on-screen presence on the show in later seasons. Either way, his character remains an indictment of a system that abandons those who buck up against it. One moment I want to highlight in Season 3 is a synthesis of some of the ideas presented in earlier seasons. In Lois's Makeover, when the boys play against Hal in a game of basketball, they come into one of the few domains where Hal feels comfortable being a domineering patriarch. The boys bend together to fight back. All right, yeah. Yeah. yeah! What are you looking at? But Hal then starts to play dirty. Sorry, son. Hey! Whoa. Eventually, they play a final game where the boys unveil their secret weapon. The boys take down the system by punching it in the balls. It's a nice little story about how the rules are stacked against the younger generation until they bound together to hit it where it hurts. So simple and so effective, this little moment I think embodies so much of what this series is, and in my opinion this is where the series peaks, with its strongest message about uniting together against an unjust authority. Future's now, old man. It isn't pretty, but it's a response in kind, and one Hal certainly won't be forgetting. Hal is the past and the boys are the future, one they'll be making more just by working together. There was still much more Malcolm in the Middle to go, and season 3 had a major one-hour special that included a number of guest stars, including Terry Bradshaw, Heidi Klum, Tom Green, Howie Long, Christina Ricci, Magic Johnson, Bradley Whitford, who was married to Jane Kaczmarek at the time, and Susan Sarandon, who was nominated for an Emmy in this appearance in the episode, Company Picnic. While ratings for season 3 were strong, and Company Picnic in particular was a great performer, the gentle decline was starting to show. The series still had some important things to say, and would of course return to some of its earlier themes as well, but much of the impact it had made in its debut was starting to wear off. He said he'd returned, he couldn't be silenced. Kid Charlemagne is back on the air. As the series progressed, Malcolm's story has tended to be less about his crawlboying friends and more about his dating life. He had numerous love interests over the years, like the blonde one, the other blonde one, and another blonde-haired girl. These stories tended to downplay his intelligence, revealing that being a genius can come hand-in-hand hand with being ignorant of how to act around a girl you have a crush on. In the episode Stupid Girl, we see Malcolm actively hide his intelligence to attract a girl named Allison, played by Brittany Finnamore. I think it'd be cool if they took the $1 bill and changed it to the $1 million bill. 
That way nobody be poor and we'd all be millionaires. <gasps> that is such a cool idea. I, I want to help poor people too. What I wanted to ask you is, um, do you want to go to dance with me on Friday? Yeah! More importantly than his love interests, Malcolm's relationship with his mother is afforded the rare opportunity to grow when she traps him for a special talk about dating. And sometimes they even convince themselves that the relationship is serious because the sex is so great. Wait, but that stop. What did you mean by validation? Validating what? Well, sometimes people will attract other people just to prove to themselves that they're likable. And if that's the reason that you're having sex with someone, you can cause a lot of damage. But if you want to have sex with someone, doesn't that mean you really like them? Oh no, honey. That's exactly the trap people fall into. Malcolm's conversation with Lois was really great. It shows this apparent-child connection that's rarely seen on sitcoms and presents it as something healthy and productive. Growing up involves seeing your parents as adults and learning from all their experiences. It's hard to imagine Lois having this conversation with Reese, so maybe it's not a perfect fit for every kid, but it's a nice contrast to seeing the boys at odds with their parents. Sadly, this wasn't followed up in any meaningful way throughout the series, which is an example, I think, of how the show was capable of producing great episodes, but couldn't change its dynamic enough in a meaningful way to capitalize on them. Another example of some of the limitations of the show appeared in the episode, if Boys Were Girls, where Lois fantasizes what her life would have been like if she had had daughters instead of sons. I hate being dumb. If I didn't grow such great hair, my head would be useless. You don't have to be a genius. You're sweet and thoughtful. And that's what counts. Aww. <laughs> wow. That was the worst fight we've had in months. <laughs> Reese has become Renee, Mimi Paley, Malcolm is Mallory, Lisa Foyles, and Dewey is Daisy, Jeanette McCurdy. Lois's fantasy eventually makes a turn for the realistic. Girls, please, can you just... Girls, don't do this. You're supposed to be easy. No, Mom, you're easy. We can fool you about anything. We're girls. We know how you think. And we're not above using it. The episode ends with Lois still wanting a girl, so the conclusion is satisfying enough as it shows parental love accepts the good with the bad, but a sign of the show losing some of its edge was watching the girls deliver the message of the episode so bluntly. Having the moral of the story delivered in such a ham-fisted way is a lot less clever than those earlier episodes. One interesting bit of trivia about this episode is that the story credit went to Alexandra Kazensky, the 11-year-old niece of the show's costume designer Heidi Kazensky. I wish they had done a better job of bringing this 11-year-old visionary's idea to life. One new idea introduced in Season 4 that the series actually built upon was Dewey's special talent, being a musical prodigy. And we find out that Hal was a YouTuber before YouTube was even a thing. There are so many things the government doesn't want you to know. And that's why they don't want Kid Charlemagne on this mic. Do I love my country? Yes. Do I vote? I used to. Until they moved our polling place to the house with the big dog. But the most important change for the series was, undoubtedly, the birth of Jamie. Early in the season, we found out Lois was pregnant, much like Jane Kaczmarek was at the time. Kaczmarek would miss several episodes because of her pregnancy, although we would see her getting increasingly pregnant on camera as well. This pregnancy came to the explosive finish in the two-parter titled, Baby. So I'm just gonna make myself some tea and relax until you get here. Good idea. You know, chamomile always relaxes me. Reese! Damn it, Reese, where are you? Ah! Was that a... oh. Oh. I got it! I got it! This is the nicest thing you've ever done for me. I am so proud of you. Oh. You can go vomit now. The baby is named Jamie, and while initially there is some mystery around the baby's gender, Jamie is eventually revealed to be a boy at the beginning of season 5. The new child undoubtedly means new hardships for the family, and perhaps that's why the season ended not with the baby being born, but instead an episode trying to find Jamie daycare, in an episode appropriately titled Daycare. In need of some assistance, the family turns to the church. Doug's pretty neat. Yeah, he's totally my favorite of all of them. 
The completely non-religious family has suddenly become inspired by the word of God. It's a simple dramatization of how religion can sometimes be less a product of spiritual discovery and more a necessity for people who need community connections to make ends meet. The episode also introduces an interesting moment where Lois realizes something about Jamie. Hell, I don't like this baby. Are you serious? I know. It's terrible. I don't deserve to be a mother. I'm supposed to be feeling all this perfect motherly love, and it's not there. It is just not there. You really don't remember, do you? Remember what? Honey, you've hated all our babies. In an episode where we see the family reject religion, we also see a mother who doesn't instantly turn into a maternal force upon meeting her baby. That's a couple of very big conventions this episode turns on their head, a rarity compared to sitcoms past. One of the great strengths of this show is that it takes very common ideas that might pop into people's minds, like not loving your child as much as you think you should, or not being religious when it's expected of you, and presents these thoughts as things not to be ashamed of, but instead to be addressed. Not living up to some unrealistic sitcom perfection is not only okay, but more realistic than the more commonly depicted happy family on the quiet street with the picket fence. This was a huge part of the appeal of Malcolm in the Middle. It portrayed a family that not only behaved in ways that felt more real, it also included characters with psychology that felt more real as well. The birth of Jamie is often described as the point where the show began its decline in quality, and while I'd personally say it happened a bit earlier, a decline in quality doesn't necessarily mean the show has gotten bad. And later seasons still had a few interesting things to say. <coughs> My parents tell me this is going to be a very special Thanksgiving. In season 5, Malcolm finally gets a job. Even though he's still in high school, he's drafted into an entry-level position at the Lucky Aid, which is the same drugstore Lois works at. Work is presented as boring and lacking in challenge. What's even more depressing is that by working alongside his mother, Malcolm is getting a glimpse into his possible future. We're proud of our 95% employee retention rate. You may think you're just starting a job, but when you join the Lucky Aid family, you're here for life. He also sees a side of Lois that he hadn't before. One minute you're telling me I'm doing a great job, and the next minute you're writing me up! You broke the rules, Malcolm. Come on, that box flattening area is a stupid rule. You know I'm right. Albert is a grade 5 employee. He has put in 20 years of service time. Sometimes that's more important than what's right or wrong. Who are you? Lois manages to convince Malcolm not to share her secret, but when the favor needs to be returned, Lois stitches Malcolm right up. It's not what it looks like. Well, Lois, are you in there? I'll explain later. I know exactly what this looks like to you, but I'm asking you for a little flexibility. Trust me. Lois, where's the... What's going on here? Well, I'll have to write Malcolm up again. He's flattened another box outside of the box flattening area. And he has no recourse. You're growing up. You're sick of living under my authority. You want me to cut you some slack. You're wondering when I'll finally see you as an adult. Well, that's never going to happen. That's just not the way it works. You can move away from home, you can get married, you can have kids of your own. You can even become a professor of physics at MIT. I will always be your mother. And that's just the way it is until one of us dies. After all this time, seeing Lois go from strict but ultimately just to becoming another tool of the system is disappointing. This is probably the saddest lesson learned in the series, that the world that's so unfair to Malcolm can also include his parents. They have to live under the same system that imposes the rules on him, and in many ways this is another example of Malcolm seeing his parents as adults, as he enters adulthood himself. Work is often the tool used to keep Malcolm and his family in their place. The only reason Malcolm has to take this job is because Hal is the victim of a corporate shakeup that he doesn't completely understand, and money is tight in the family. Work is consistently shown as a means of being exploited by someone somewhere. Way back in Season 1, in the episode Malcolm Babysits, Malcolm gets his first ever taste of employment working as a babysitter, only to find out that the generous couple had been secretly recording him the whole time. A few lines from Lois and Helen in this episode make the point especially clear. I don't even know what they're going to pay me! I'll tell you what they're going to pay you. They're going to pay you what all jobs pay. Less than you're worth and just enough to keep you crawling back for more. So how's the job going? They were jerks, so I quit. Well, that's pretty much what work is. Welcome to the club. And in season two, we see what Hal's life would have been like outside of work, where he dedicates his time to creating a painting. Hal goes on a roller coaster, becoming a more effective parent, to becoming an obsessive painter, to finally creating something truly beautiful. I did it. I really did it. What's that sound? 
I don't know. It sounds like... The family can never have anything good, and the world seems to constantly be working against it. Why do we root for these losers? Because they never give up? Is that what life is? Getting knocked down over and over again? Always getting up? Until you die? A piece of art that immediately self-destructs is a good metaphor from that case. The only options Hal has now is to pick up the brush again, or forget it and go back to work. And who can't relate to putting your dreams on hold because you have to go out there and make a living? It makes Hal want to stand up and do something about it. Although I really only mentioned this episode because it included one other moment I wanted to highlight. I've had this cute lab partner in science for eight weeks now. Her name is Cheryl. I finally left Cheryl a note on her desk asking her out. And when she read it, she turned to me and said, Do you know who Reese is? So then she goes, Does anybody know who Reese is? And everybody shrugged. So then I said, Probably some nobody. And you know what? I was right. Okay, now that I've brought the mood down, let's talk about Reese. Although often presented as a dumb force of destruction, he's probably the most tragic character in the principal cast. You don't have any friends. Mom told you you're never allowed to talk about that. Stupid. I hate you. I hate you. Then I worked on my triceps. I want to break up. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, th that's okay. Yeah, it's fine. No, I was just kidding anyway about... Yeah, it's no biggie. Look, Reese, it's not you, it's me. I just think I can do better. Reese is a very tough character to like. He's a bully and completely heartless at times, but he's also capable of showing some genuine concern for others, at least when it comes to his family. I'll say grace. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the talent to express my love for my family in the only way I know how. Amen. In Reese's apartment, we see a great example of what's really holding him back. He's just not that bright. You've been using credit cards? How much have you spent? 10, 11 grand. But I'm still way under the $20,000 limit. How can you spend that much in 10 days? Well, you know, I got that new convection oven, and that made the refrigerator look kind of shabby. Plus, I had to buy new clothes every time mine got dirty. And that giant gong in the bathroom. I mean, how do you guys do it? And this is his whole character in a nutshell. He's not that smart. And not being that smart makes an already tough world that much tougher. His options are limited, and he's left to lash out violently. That may be why this season ends with a two-parter titled, Reese Joins the Army, and Reese Becomes the Ideal Soldier. I figured out that using my brain was the whole problem. Not just here, but my entire life. But if I just do exactly what I'm told and nothing else, then everything gets easy. It's not even a question of smart or dumb. You just turn yourself into a tool. But eventually, Reese has to turn on his brain and use his misbehaving to win the war game. What good's the diversion gonna do? We're tied up. I guess your brothers never tied you up and left you in a dumpster on trash day. <sighs> Captain, I suggest you surrender. If not, I have enough flour packed in this barrel to bake 500 cakes. All right, don't fire. We hereby surrender. Eh, what the hell? It's frightening to think that what makes Reese a good soldier is that he can go from unthinking robot to malevolent troublemaker. Both are apparently crucial modes for a soldier, at least according to the show. And this season ends with Reese headed into active duty in Afghanistan. As a character, Reese seems to have the dimmest future ahead of him. His good qualities can only manifest in environments that he spent years carving out a space in, and the US military is less patient with him than Lois, ready to ship him off to Afghanistan rather than send him to his room. I've seen you take pizza from the garbage and eat it. Season 6 resolves the Reese plotline with Lois traveling to somewhere in non-specific South Asia to bring him home. What in the name of God were you thinking? With the US government failing him, Reese's only salvation is, once again, his family. 
The old theme of family holding together in the face of an indifferent society returns, albeit in a very extreme and strange way that's less compelling than it was the first time around. The commentary on the military could have just as easily been applied to Francis's time in the military academy. One major change was the larger role in the series for Dewey. In season 5, due to a mix-up at his school, Dewey is placed in the special ed class and we're introduced to a supporting cast of kids called Buseys, taking their name from the actor Gary Busey, known for his eccentric behavior. This gives us a glimpse into the lives of the kids in the special education class. While a premise like this could have taken a very bad turn, the show instead reveals how placing these children in classes that have given up on them only makes things worse, and the differences displayed between the special needs and gifted classes are so stark that I can't help but read a very real commentary on social class differences here. All it takes is doing poorly on some tests, and then your change in class means you'll be perpetually falling behind your peers, forced to watch them excel in ways you'll never have a chance to. Much like Reese's military adventure mirrored Francis's, a change in class for Dewey, and a metaphor for a change in social class, mirrors Malcolm's. Although there's a less promising future in Dewey's new class. Season 6 takes the special ed class premise and continues to build on it, with the Busey kids appearing in several episodes. Each of them revolve around the basic idea that they need Dewey to take care of them, whether it's an episode where they all run away to live in a tree, or an episode where Dewey arranges for them to be in an opera based on his family's internal strife. Although generally a decent depiction of kids with special needs, taking some time to portray them as having personalities and not just a walking collection of symptoms, their dependency on Dewey borders on depressing at times. In the episode Busey's Take a Hostage, Dewey has neglected his friends and without his guidance, they lash out at their teacher. Excuse me, Mr. Flirch? Well, I think of the three ideas we had, this was the best. This episode goes a long way in explaining how these kids, left behind by the system, desperately cling to the one person who offers them the chance to have fuller lives. And the fact that this person is also a kid puts a huge strain on him, and he neglects them. It's ridiculous to imagine that a classroom full of kids should be cared for by another kid. This is a portrait of how society has failed the children who need them the most, and even worse, lets them be exploited. Mr. Jeffers, I would be horrified to think that a public school principal would use innocent children as slave labor. The episode's framing sadly obscures this point, as demonstrated by Francis' talk with Dewey, where he's told he shouldn't shirk his responsibilities. Oh. You don't understand these kids. If I fix this problem, there's going to be a hundred more. It never stops with them. Dewey, you don't get to choose the people who need your help. The idea that this should be on Dewey is completely backwards. The kids in the class need help, and even if Dewey can somehow get them through the year, is his life now just taking care of them? And what about kids in other grades? They would have to hope to get lucky enough to have a compassionate caretaker. Dewey is forced to sacrifice his own happiness for others, and the show's framing of this as admirable, while positive on its face, is more accurately read as a complete failure of the system. One person cannot fix a system on their own, though when one person makes a stand, it can sometimes inspire a greater call to action. In the episode Billboard, the boys vandalize a giant billboard, and when caught, they try to play it off as activism. We're not coming down until women everywhere get the respect they deserve! No matter how long it takes, we're staying up here! Oh, for the love of God, I don't know who you think you're fooling! It's about time! Thank you, boys! God yeah. bless oh, you! God. They really believe in this stuff. That is such a load. Every woman down there is just here because they're jealous. Of what? Of the fact that they're not hot enough to be strippers. As the episode progresses, Reese has a realization about women. I guess what these protesters are trying to say is that women, real women, aren't that different from regular people. They want the same things that men want. Only men don't have to hold a big protest to get them. And women shouldn't have to either. The idea of using activism to escape blame is interesting, and it fits in with the cynicism of the show. Although the power of activism affecting change, even on the people exploiting it, demonstrates its power. We are who we pretend to be, after all. And maybe even performative activism is better than doing nothing at all. In the episode Tiki Lounge, this same idea is taken a step further when Malcolm is forced into joining his school's booster club, a blisteringly positive group of teens always looking to hold special events to raise money for charity. Malcolm assumes they're just a bunch of phonies looking for an excuse to throw a party, and their unrelenting positivity is a cover for their insincerity. While running the auction, he tries to expose their hypocrisy. First item up, our own Stephanie Wright has agreed to put up for auction a photograph of herself from 8th grade with her original nose. Ten dollars! Twenty! Thirty! Forty! Fifty! Eighty-five dollars! 
Yeah. So. That is so much money. We're raising so much money. For an extra $50, I'll throw in a picture of me from before Fat Camp in a bikini. $50. I appreciate that the Booster Club really was passionate about the causes they claim to care about, even though they're not very good at raising money. It's a very kind critique of the champagne liberal stereotype. Their hearts may be in the right place, but their methods are less than ideal. I would let the top bidder cover my mouth with duct tape every morning for a week. This is one of the best nights of my life, and I actually learned something about myself. I was having this giant conflict that I thought was about my principles, but it was really just about my own pride. And all I had to do to fix it was get over myself. A lot of the praise for a show like Malcolm in the Middle I see from people further on the left often touts its realism. And that realism, especially in earlier seasons, is often buoyed by a deep cynicism about the world. Unlike previous episodes though, this episode was surprisingly positive in its outlook and conclusion, offering the important lesson that setting aside pride can help different groups of people achieve great things thinking of the modern day and the temptation of people further left to mock liberals for their hypocrisy makes this episode seem like a stark contrast to that tendency, as it offers a counterpoint that good things are possible when working on goals together with people who may be misguided in their methods, but are ultimately interested in helping other people. And it's better to set pride aside to achieve positive change rather than sneer at people who could be allies. They canceled my piercing grant. That was $3,000. They're using the money to do a study on what happens to kids who can't afford college. The season 7 premiere, Burning Man, took the family on the road to experience the Desert Festival. It's weirdly fitting and strangely out of place at the same time, a familiar feeling in the later seasons. There's one interesting part where Hal's suburban father routine is considered an art piece. Best hamburgers and dogs you've ever tasted are on me when I get this baby fired up. <laughs> What's he doing? It's performance art. He's skewering the empty banality of the modern suburban dad. Is this show art? What even is art? Is it the depiction of the real? The unreal? Is it an emotional experience or an intellectual encounter? Hal's subplot seems to be asking these questions about the show, with the crowd viewing him as a stand-in for suburbia, offering them a window into this forbidden space. Is that, then, how we, the audience of the show, also experience it? Or do we feel kinship with Hal's perspective, seeing these eccentrics as the outsiders? We're watching them watching him, but also watching him watch them. Art is the act of watching someone in a space we can never enter, as our stand-in is entering it for us. We will never go to Burning Man, or rather, we will never go to the idea we have of Burning Man that this show is representing. Or maybe more accurately, the show is mocking the kind of overwrought artistic interpretation like the one I just gave. Malcolm in the Middle is a show that, when it works, feels very real. It's conveying the idea of a family struggling to survive in a world that sees them as commodities to be exploited. When they go on adventures like this one, it starts to feel less real. It's more like a hallucination out in the desert. The season 7 premiere scored a 3.5 in the ratings, which is a very far cry from its earlier seasons. On average, it was getting less than 4 million viewers per episode. In January of 2006, Fox announced that Malcolm in the Middle would be ending this season. Francis had largely exited the show by this point, only appearing in a handful of episodes, but Christopher Masterson was still a part of the series, directing an episode this season titled Hal Greaves. Masterson wasn't the only cast member to direct an episode in the series, though. Brian Cranston directed several episodes in the series, including Malcolm Defends Reese, which also aired this season. The final season still managed to effectively hit some familiar notes, such as in Lois Strikes Back, where Lois decides to get even with some mean girls who played a cruel prank on Reese. Reese was completely blindsided, huh? You know what? I have had it. How would you like it if I called the superintendent and told him all about this? Great! I'll put him on the speakerphone. <laughs> Lois uses some brutal techniques. Baby! <sighs> no! <laughs> the idea that certain people are less deserving of justice because they're troublemakers might have landed clearer had Reese been less of a jerk in earlier episodes. It also doesn't help that the show kind of had the same premise for an episode a few seasons back, in which a teacher flunks Reese because he thinks he's a punk. The episode ends with Lois and Reese finally having something to bond over, the use of cruelty to satisfy their need for justice. Although Reese is 
probably just in it for the cruelty. As the series wound down, it brought into focus Malcolm and Reese's final year of high school, Reese having deliberately failed a grade so he could spend another year there. Well established as a social outcast, Malcolm works with some of the other school misfits to hold a morp. That's prom spelled backwards. A counterparty for the prom happening in the gym, the morp is in the basement. Malcolm's insecurity gets the better of him, and he has to confront the other kids to let them know he and his outsider friends are having a good time. I just thought you people should know that while you're up here enjoying what you've deluded yourselves into thinking is the greatest night of your lives, the people who you've excluded from this charade are downstairs right now having a party that obliterates yours. You think you're on the inside, but you're on the outside. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I'll be a good kid. And no one cares. But eventually the two parties come together, bridges are mended, and the kids decide to leave high school behind, which isn't enough for Malcolm. AJ, you can't be serious. Hey, it took guts for those girls to come down here and apologize. And I'd like to think I'm big enough to be able to admit I'd like to have sex with one of them. You can't just let them say I'm sorry after 12 years of treating us like crap! It's moments like this that seem to contrast the Malcolm we knew just a season ago, ready to join up with the boosters when he realizes their genuine desire to do good, but that's not the Malcolm we have anymore. And this represents a Malcolm we see more frequently in these later seasons where he's not quite the charming eccentric he was originally written as. And that brings us to the final episode of the series, Graduation, airing May 14th, 2006. The premise for this episode is that Malcolm's family is struggling to find a way to afford sending him to college. Kids with half your brains are getting full rides! They didn't correct their interviewer on his pronunciation of Sart. Linwood Boomer, the creator of the series, makes a fun cameo in this episode playing a loan shark Hal tries to get money from. Couldn't I just not give you the money and still break your arms and legs? Wouldn't that accomplish the same thing? A friend of Abe, Stevie's father, shows up to offer Malcolm a shortcut, letting him skip college and go straight into the workforce with a hefty six-figure salary. Well, I, uh... That's a very generous offer, Mr. Hampton, but no. Mom, what are you... Malcolm's going to college. He's going to finish his education, but thank you very much. He wasn't asking you. He was... Ma'am, I completely understand. I should have talked to you first. Consider the offer withdrawn. Sorry, kid. 24-7 job. You need your whole family behind you. And don't be mad at your mom. She's only trying to look out for you. Who knows how far I would have gone if I went to college. A garbage bomb set up by Reese goes off early in the car, and we get an exchange that sums up the series. Now my life looks exactly how I feel. How could you screw me over like that? Because you were going to take that job, and we are not going to let you throw your life away. How is being rich throwing my life away? Because it's not the life you're supposed to have. The life you're supposed to have is you go to Harvard, and you earn every fellowship and internship they have. You graduate first in your class and you start working in public service, either district attorney or running some foundation, and then you become governor of a mid-sized state, and then you become president. What? Of the United States. Dad! I'm sorry, son. It's true. You'll be the only person in that position who will ever give a crap about people like us. We've been getting the short end of the stick for thousands of years, and I, for one, am sick of it. You know what it's like to be poor, and you know what it's like to work hard. Now you're going to learn what it's like to sweep floors and bust your ass and accomplish twice as much as all the kids around you. And it won't mean anything because they will still look down on you. And you will want so much for them to like you, and they just won't. And it'll break your heart. And that'll make your heart bigger and open your eyes, and finally you will realize that there's more to life than proving you're the smartest person in the world. I'm sorry, Malcolm, but you don't get the easy path. You don't get to just have fun and be rich and live the life of luxury. That's Dewey. Really? This is unbelievable. You actually expect me to be president. No, 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 I'm sorry. You expect me to be one of the greatest presidents in the history of the United States. You look me in the eye and you tell me you can't do it. The show wraps up with a few interesting visuals, such as this callback to the first episode. Another callback to the first episode is once again revealing the family's last name through Francis' name tag at his new office job, only now the last name we see is no last name. That name is also clearly mouthed by the speaker during graduation when Malcolm is introduced as valedictorian. And the scene closes with Malcolm delivering a nice speech about family. 
and the series comes to an end with an epilogue, giving us a sense of where all these characters are heading. The final line of the series is... Listen, I'm gonna get to my cow class. I'll talk to you later. A huge part of what made the series work so well was the obvious chemistry between the actors on screen. It felt like a real family, and in some ways it was. Frankie Muniz spoke to that in a recent interview. It really did feel like a family, especially with us kids. We spent more time together than we did with our real families. We'd be outside playing kickball and sports, and we'd be arguing, fighting, bickering, and playing pranks on each other just like brothers would. So in that sense, you really do become like a family. While the family in Malcolm in the Middle was consistently at each other's throats, they also demonstrated the love they had for one another and how protective they were against the outside world. That struck a chord for any family that knew how to band together when it counted. Life is unfair. Following the end of the series, Frankie Muniz took a handful of roles over the years, but largely stepped away from the world of acting. Sadly, Muniz has had continuing difficulties with his health, including two transient ischemic attacks, also known as mini-strokes, and nine concussions. Muniz believes this is the reason his memory has been severely compromised, to the point where he struggles to remember his time on Malcolm in the Middle. That said, he has reported memories returning to him and generally seems happy in his life. He and his wife are expecting their first child in early 2021. Although he was nominated for three Emmys for Malcolm in the Middle, Brian Cranston's career really took off in 2008 when he was cast as Walter White on Breaking Bad, a role completely unlike Hal, and one which earned him four Emmys, enormous ratings, and glowing praise as one of the most iconic roles on television. So he became a pretty big deal. Cranston has been working on high-profile projects ever since, though he clearly has some affinity for his time on Malcolm in the Middle, going so far as to film a bonus alternate ending to Breaking Bad, which features him waking up as Hal, realizing the Walter White character was just a dream. The same scene included Jane Kaczmarek, who, post Malcolm in the Middle, found her career completely changed. Although she hasn't been cast in a role quite as prominent as Lois since her time on the show, in an interview she spoke about struggling to get auditions and never being considered for comedy roles at all prior to her time on Malcolm in the Middle. Since the show ended, she's had a steady stream of roles on dozens of projects. Christopher Masterson acted in a handful of projects after Malcolm in the Middle ended, though he seems to have transitioned out of acting entirely in 2014 and now works as a DJ. One fun fact I found about the role of Francis is that Brian Cranston's Breaking Bad co-star, Aaron Paul, had auditioned for the role, though the part eventually went to Masterson. Justin Burfield moved away from acting almost immediately after Malcolm in the Middle ended and went into working as a producer, working on several projects before eventually becoming the chief creative officer at Virgin Produced. Eric Persullivan also stepped out of the acting world, having only appeared in four projects after Malcolm in the Middle, the last one released in 2010. Sullivan has largely left the public eye, though a handful of photos and appearances have emerged in recent years. Since the show's end, there has been some discussion on bringing Malcolm in the Middle back in some capacity. Some of the cast members shared their thoughts on a revival. We've talked about how fun it'd be to do a reunion show, season, or a movie, and I don't think anything excites me more. I'd love it because I had such a great time doing the show, and the whole cast was amazing. I feel like we have more story to tell, especially 20 years later. There were so many possibilities about what the family could be up to. As a fan of the show, I want to know what happened. I remember one of the final things in that final episode in 2006. Hal and I are rejoicing that we've got two kids out of the house and I go home with a pregnancy stick and you hear us both screaming because I'm pregnant again. If that was true, we'd have a 14-year-old. We'd have another Malcolm at home because when the show started, Malcolm was 14. I told Linwin this thing still resonates. I want him to pull him out of retirement and have him write a reunion movie. If we were to produce a Malcolm in the Middle 20 years later show, we'd absolutely contact every single crew member to come back because that's the family. I'm going to keep working on him. I think I can convince him. Like a good wine, it endures. It passes the test of time. It's a classic story and series, and I couldn't be prouder. It remains to be seen if anything concrete will materialize, particularly with Linwood Boomer seemingly content with the show not coming back. But in August of 2020, there was a small reunion for many of the cast members on the show. They performed a reading of the first episode of the series over Zoom. Tickets sold to the viewing raised funds for Healing California, a charitable organization that provides free dental, medical, and vision care. A handful of photos have emerged from the event, and a number of guest stars who appeared in the series throughout the years can be spotted making cameos. Watching this series was a strange experience. At the time of its airing, I was at that young age where I could relate to the younger characters, but now I'm not quite old enough to relate to the adults with children. Late in the series, there's a scene where Hal and a random kid are dancing on an arcade machine that is legally distinct from a Dance Dance Revolution machine. 
In this footage, I can see my past and my future, and while I could probably smoke both of these scrubs at DVR, I think the power of the series is in moments like this, seemingly absurd but utterly relatable, speaking across generations. Malcolm in the Middle was a major force in popularizing the single-camera style sitcom on network television. It helped end the age of laugh tracks, introduced more sophisticated uses of music, and let characters travel to a number of exciting and not-so-exciting locations. But through these stylistic accomplishments, at its core was the story of a family struggling with one another and uniting together to take on the world. The idea of life being an endless struggle is at the center of what makes the show feel real. It's relatable to anyone who feels that they live in a world where you can feel lost in a crowd, vanishing into faceless anonymity, like a middle child constantly overlooked by their family. But even though Malcolm was the middle child, if you don't count Francis, until Jamie is born, his family never treat him that way. Hal and Lois love all their boys, hard as that may be sometimes, and in spite of the rough edges of their dynamic, they're there for one another. In a recent interview, Jane Kaczmarek summed this up. People say they're such a dysfunctional family, and I would think, are you kidding me? They sit down for dinner together every night. Those kids don't get away with anything. This is a highly functioning family. They're mean, loud, and aggressive, but they're highly functioning. When Malcolm runs off to one day be president, he does so with the knowledge of what it means to suffer. Instead of falling into a cynicism and despair, the show leaves us with some degree of hope that things might change and get better. But Malcolm's very existence has always been absurd. A child genius who was born in just the right circumstances to change the world around him. The solution to the struggle Malcolm's family faces is to get extremely lucky, and that's the hope for people like them in their world, that someone like Malcolm might be born in the right family to make things better. Man, what are the odds of that happening? It's an indictment of the world they live in. And for anyone who struggled to get ahead in the world, sometimes it feels like the only solution is to become extremely lucky, something that, for most people, only exists in the world of fantasy. So that is Malcolm in the Middle in the books. To be honest, I had actually stopped watching Malcolm in the Middle when it was first airing around season four or five-ish. So seeing those later seasons was um, a first for me. And for anyone curious, Malcolm in the Middle is easily the most demanded series I've had for one of these retrospectives. And I hope people enjoyed this. And if you really enjoyed it, why not become a patron or a member? You can either go to my Patreon and sign up for a monthly donation, or you can click the join button on my YouTube page and become a member. The benefits include early access to videos like this one, download links for my theme songs, and your name in the credits, like these lovely people right here. There were so many things in this show I didn't get to mention, so if you have a favorite memory of Malcolm in the Middle, feel free to leave it below in the comments. Also, why not like this video? And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to ring the bell. Thank you everyone so much for watching.